this is, the idea is for this to be a very interactive session, so I, I wanted to go through first, just real quickly, as an example, like what we're, what we're doing right now in Kenya and how we're trying to scale those kinds of solutions. And these are all just pictures that I got sent yesterday from people in the field working on these currencies there. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to play a, a bit of a game, so. Um, this, this organization I started in 2010, and uh, um, we started printing vouchers in Kenya as a means of exchange for people. And we've been doing that progressively and progressively um, till, till now we've got about 6,000 small businesses that use these networks. Um, I, I started this work about, that was me 20 years ago at Stanford at the Accelerator. And, I got super into aging-based modeling, and I got really unhappy with uh, trying to look for pentaquarks. Turns out they don't exist, and uh, um, so I started doing agent-based modeling. And the idea behind it was that if you could change one thing about economic systems, it was who it gets to issue the money. And I was very connected with my my parents did a lot of uh, aid work and. Um, Someone told me one day that um, people creating currencies was just a normal thing, that it was being done all around the world. There was a book uh, by Bernard Leotard that started popularizing these ideas, and this was like back in 2007. There were some numbers like this, but no one really knew exactly how many of these little local currencies were existing around the world. And I, um, so I left physics and I started going into economics, and I went and started studying these in the US and in Europe. And, um, and there's a lot of actually super impressive systems. I mean, here in Japan, actually, a, a lot of the history of community currencies um, started in terms of like, them being popularized even by the state and national like municipalities. Um, so there's, there's a really long history to this. And really, you could say that people creating money is, was how, well, I mean, creating local currencies was how all currencies started in the first place. Um, and I started doing development work in Kenya, thinking that, well, you know, all of these solutions that we saw all around the world, in terms of groups getting together and creating their own endogenous local money, like this would be a place where there's a lot of excess capacity and very, very little actual medium of exchange to, to make liquid that capacity in, in goods and services. And so I moved into the slums. Um, this is Kibera, but I, I, I was in all sorts of slums across Kenya. And we started um, getting together uh, groups of businesses in those areas and basically just coming up with basic agreements and playing games like, um, like we're going to do today, just as a, as a demonstration, and just coming up with what are, what are the sort of rule sets we would need to make a functional medium of exchange in the vacuum of the Kenyan shilling. So when the Kenyan shilling is doing very well, you don't need this stuff, but when it goes down, can we create this sort of counter cyclic mechanism so that the, these guys can still trade their goods and services? And, and it's, it's good to see when, when does that break down and how we've been uh, trying to bypass those challenges. Um, a lot of the, the original work I did in Kenya was uh, based on the idea that there's a lot of aid flowing into, into Africa, like Fanny mentioned, and all over the world, and that mostly it's, it's ineffective. There's huge amounts of middlemen that are taking 80% you know, of the actual money, and very little gets uh, to actual people's hands. Um, and even when it does, it tends to just be a band-aid. It's not really building um, local economies. Um, and so we would work, the, the idea of this was that you're connecting marketplaces together so that people can build more and more on top of that, and that the money doesn't just come into a community and run back out, that there's a, there's a time for it to sort of sink in. And so there's huge amounts of like projects that we did where, like in this example, people were collecting trash in this community, but all the businesses that were using these were the organizers of it. The people would be given out uh, vouchers for sorting through trash, and we're trying to clean up the all the plastic that is there's a lot of water in it, and a lot of mosquitoes, so there's a huge amount of malaria in the area. Um, and so people would get these to collect trash, they could go and use them at the businesses, the businesses could circulate them, and then there was some collateral behind this in donor funds, in, in that case. Um, and that was all great, it, until the donor funds were over, right? Um, and so that was like a one-year project where we were, you know, it was, 
we saw about five times the circulation and, and the usage of the money. So if we had paid people to just collect the trash, we would have gotten you know one fifth of the, the actual effect. So it was a, it was a nice test. So that was the first one I did. This was the the second one, and this one ended up getting really popular. And we didn't back it with anything. Um, we went into businesses just like I showed you before, and we just said, hey, we're going to create vouchers for everybody. So everyone starts with about four dollars worth of vouchers, which is enough for about a, a meal, and they were just going to uh, voluntarily trade them amongst themselves. And they had a system of kind of a social guarantee where if you know, Nick spends his and then stops accepting them back, he had four guarantors that would go and beat him up or, or do, you know, that sort of thing. Um, not really beat him up, but just, you know, uh, figure out what's wrong, help his business if, if there was a problem. So it was a nice uh, community support mechanism. Um, and, um, we had a huge bloom out of that. There was a lot of trade going on. Um, we were, you know, we had grad students there that were helping do uh, like tracking serial numbers at the time, and, and you know, very low tech. We had stickers so people would know where to spend them. We had quite a few schools involved so kids could pay their school fees. Uh, this charcoal. This is like a mandazi, um, and it was going so well that people started also trying to bribe the police with them, and then they took us to jail. <laughs> um, and uh, and so this is you know like you know as we start to talk about like what are the challenges of working in these areas as well this is so all of this stuff is very unregulated um, you know banks don't necessarily like it when other people print money um, and so the central bank came after us and put us in jail and charged us with um, well, a few things. I, originally, it was terrorism. They, they claimed we were part of Al-Shabaab and we were doing uh, secessionist plots. And it was a time where that was there was a lot of that going on in Kenya also, so it was kind of you know, bad timing in, in a sense. Um, eventually, they charged us with um, forgery. And uh, we went through about six months of court cases and eventually the, the Attorney General, we did a big petition internationally. So like all those projects I was showing you before, they actually, there, there was a meetup in Japan just here a month ago and every two years there's a meetup of all the these community currency practitioners and researchers uh, it's worth worth checking out um, so anyway they, there was a big international petition and the, the government was very embarrassed about, about the situation because it was it, it got to be a big news thing we were at, you know there was a there was a comedy show that was created based on this as well um, in Kenya so it was just it was like you know all these people in in these places where the government doesn't help them at all they have no rights whatsoever um, were making their own money and it was circulating more and more useful to them than the Kenyan shillings which were just there once in a while right? so it was filling the gap in other words and, uh, and the fact that the government would come after us in this way was really a, a it, was in, it ended up being very, very embarrassing to the government. And uh, um, so the Attorney General came out and said, there's no law being broken here under Kenya Revenue Authority, like taxation or the Central Banking Act. And so that was like, we, we were given a clean slate. We didn't, they also recommended that the central bank start to regulate these things. And they, so now that we've gone blockchain and we're not printing so much anymore, they do actually like us a bit more because um, they want to, be a bit uh, tech savvy, um, and uh, so we'll see. So this is relaunching after that court case. Like this is one of the members of parliament here uh, coming out, and these are you know the people voting. This is his voting block, you know, essentially. So um, there was a lot of a huge hype, and then pretty soon after we launched another five currencies around Nairobi and some more in Mombasa. And like this is the local chief. This is actually two different uh, uh, school headmasters. Um, and and always there was this idea of you know what's what's behind these. So back back then you know like there was no hard guarantee. There was these a lot of soft guarantees. You know it was essentially a social backing um, without the ability to litigate or anything like that. It was and and you would end up with a lot of uh, uh, often like traffic jams with these things. Like you know if you know, like Kim here stops accepting them one day and we were all expecting him to accept them. Let's say he just moves or, you know, his, his business is shut down. You get a lot of this situation where people lose confidence quite quickly in them. So you end up with this kind of stop, go, stop, go. And most of these groups were about 
100 to 200 businesses like of that scale, and none of them really grew much bigger than that. And there, there was this general problem of like, how do they even know each other? You know that they're accepting it, and then how do they how do they build cohesion around it? And a lot of those groups are also very like, tribal. They speak a certain language, and and you know they really don't want to grow much bigger than that. And so. You know the the group size, the group unit. In, in fact, even today, we still kind of use that unit. The trick has been coming up with protocols that connect them together. So all these groups creating their currencies, and we'll go into a, a little bit how that works. So, like a twenty shilling note here. What was really gratifying to me was that this these notes were changing hands maybe about twice a day, and you know this is based on serial numbers way back then. We have actual data now to back that up. Um, and that's about the cost of a meal. Um, and that one piece of paper was facilitating about 700 meals, new meals in the community uh, a year. And that just makes my hair stand up on it because it's huge. I mean, if you can imagine one piece of paper enables 700 meals over a year, one physical little stupid piece of paper, it's, it, it makes it ridiculous what we're doing as humans in a sense. like we. People are not eating because they're missing pieces of paper. It's weird, right? And, and here, you know, we're talking billions of people living in, in this basic lifestyle where money is sometimes there, sometimes not, and the ability to barter is, it doesn't really exist. You have this kind of coincidence of once, you know, you can't really always be trading, you know, um, fish for water or things like that. It just, it really doesn't work, and you end up with a lot of informal debt. And so one of the first things that people do when they start using these is they clear a lot of those, like, 20 shilling debts that they've had with their neighbor for five years and they hated each other before. And we had an interesting study that showed that people were like 300 times more likely to start doing gifting with each other after starting these programs because they cleared a lot of that debt. Um, I just, you know, so there's, we do a bit of branding when we go into, uh, you know, like a, a, the first community in an area, but then they start spreading it out from there. Um, this guy's selling water right here. Um, you know, and what's his motivation? He's he's joining because he gets an initial amount of credit in in the, in the group, and he's getting a lot more customers. Is the idea? So his turnover is going up and up and up. Um, I mean, generally we see something like an increase of about thirty percent turnover for a business in the first few months of, of joining one of these programs. Um, so, yeah, uh, this might be a, a stupid question, but yeah. why is the national currency not there in the first place? Yeah. I, I mean, there's a lot of challenges around distribution, you know, like, there's, I mean, obviously, like, there, you could say there's enough money in the world, like, if we had one dollar in the world and it was moving at the speed of light, that'd be enough, right? So we just have terribly inefficient markets where money is also just pooling and collecting in certain areas. And so, you know, I mean, if in traditional economics you would say, well, if there's supply and demand in the community, well then, you know, prices of commodities should go up and down, so whatever is remaining money should be enough. but prices are, are not elastic, right? And so you end up with this situation where there's literally just a, a swamp of money maybe in, um, you know, uh, post-harvest season, and then all of that money is spent on things like, you know, external stuff like uh, uh, sending your kid off to a boarding school or uh, paying for petrol or, or gas in your car. And so it just, there's, it's like a, this analogy of having a bucket, right? Like you've got a bucket of water and there's just this linking hole coming out the side. So you, you throw money at that problem, but it's leaking out so quickly that there's nothing you can do to, to allow that money to stay there long enough to build industries and, and produce more employment. And so a lot of these programs, like the cash transfer programs, you're dealing with giant holes you know, in that bucket. And you, know, like, you would hope that the money produces enough uh, capacity in the community to start absorbing more and more of that money and using it in the community, but that's just generally not the case. So, I, I mean, there's a lot of different factors to that, and we, we can discuss more. Um, so we, we go a lot through the entire supply chain. Mostly this is all to, I mean, really it's, we go into a community, we do a lot of training with the chief and elders as we as we go in, but then it just becomes word of mouth at that point. Hey, well, um, yeah. Something. Also, I mean, these are communities that are living on less than like a dollar a day, anyways. And so the quantum of cash thing is is more important in terms of that they need not actually have enough to live on, right? Eighty percent of the world's poor is living like in these type of areas, 
and it's actually growing. So, so they may have some scraps of cash around, but it's the quantum of cash that's really important. Yeah. Right? It, it, this, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, and so, you know, what's super important in these systems is uh, some levels of social backing or um, local production, local goods and services. And so, like schools, for instance, or baby schools or, or primary schools, they're paying tuition fees, they're paying all sorts of fees. Um, and so, if those teachers can be getting part of their salary in these systems, the parents can be paying that, the teachers can use it for food in the community, can circulate back to the community. So, schools ended up being a good sink for the currency and a, and a nice sort of like backer of last resort. Um, uh, a cooperative maize mills is, is another um, thing that, that was really super popular where like this group was actually working with Red Cross uh, years before this and Red Cross come in, came in and pumped a bunch of cash into the community because it was a food insecure area and they had the community, they actually trained them to do collective farming work and dig water pans together and so they actually spurred a lot of really actually good healthy community action but they were paying for it directly. And when they stopped paying for it, all the system just collapsed again. And so this was one of about 500 groups that Red Cross did this in. And they saw what we were doing on the coast and they started their own system. Um, and so like they were the one group out of this massive groups of farmers that started doing this. And they've grown to about 2,000 users now. So they've gone to about 23 different villages now. And so they're spreading super rapidly. And so what, in this case, what they did was they said, well, to replace that money of Red Cross, we are basically going to create a voucher. We give it out, uh, essentially just one airdrop to the whole community of the same four dollars. About that four dollars can be used at this cooperative maize mill, so they can bring their, their corn to grind it, and so that's the service everyone knows they can always get for it. They would then take any excess, so they would pay off their operating costs in that, so they have some workers there, and then any excess operating cost goes back to pay for those activities that they were doing with Red Cross. So they created their own funding mechanism for doing that, and so it keeps going around. And then all the other businesses started accepting it. So as long as everyone knows there was actually some fundamental backing there, that was enough to build that trust in that system. And so I think we're going to go back to this idea of like, your, your piece of paper or your token is a guarantee against what? You know, and, and just how important is that trust? Um, you know, let's say, um, uh, distribution shops. Uh, this is a uh, coconut oil. Um, this is uh, just an example. Marciana. She's 64. She takes care of her family of seven. She lost her her um, her daughter, and um, so she's the grandmother of those kids. And she makes Fuji which is like a porridge and basically there's a huge, there's, a, there's quite a few periods like, uh, like January for instance or maybe the, the first week of every month where like the market generally crash and people don't have enough money to, to pay for her uh, Uji but now she has a whole market of people that can still come in with these, she can use them to pay for her kids school fees, she can use them to buy her ingredients and so she has enough market now with this to stay so that her kids are less hungry they're they're and they're going to school more regularly before president. Um, this is my co-founder Carolyn Delma and um, you know she basically goes into these communities she's she's generally one of the people who, who does the initial training with uh, the elders and the chiefs and the, and the women um, and then she brings in a woman like that to go train the next community um, and she's been amazingly effective at creating like viral mechanisms where like this person gets incentivized to go and build the next currency in the next community and that next community can actually pay this woman with their currency um, to, to, to facilitate, set it up and do the training. Um, so I wanted to do a game real quick here. So, yeah. So everyone's going to get two fives and two tens, and these are some of the currencies we use in Kenya. And if, if you have a pen, if you can write your contact on the back, some you know, like either a Telegram or Twitter handle, that would be good. Cool. So basically, what you're doing here, you're minting your money. Right? So imagine you're a business. Think about. Oh yeah. Got a bar um, so think about what you can offer. Um, so in this in this simulation here, we're we're a market. I'm going to have you guys eventually all stand up. 
And the idea is, what could you sell to someone else in this room? And let's say it's maybe a secret, maybe it's advice, maybe you know some tips on pole dancing, and wh whatever it is, um, think about what, what you can offer. Um, think about what you want and need to buy, and, and, and basically go ahead and try to like buy and sell. I'm just going to give you five minutes to just kind of experience this process, you know, and in Kenya, imagine, you know, you're a group of businesses selling different types of vegetables and shoes and imported items or services, right? So let me tell everybody's got them. And I'm just going to give you guys a few minutes and I'll, 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 ring, a, I'll ring a bell when you guys should stop trading. Okay? Everybody good? Everybody got some money? If any, you should have some here. So yeah, it, so if you would write your name on it, write your name on the backs of them. You'll see like there's an endorsement area on the back. Because again, these are claims against what, right? If you think about this, if you're a, a business and you're minting vouchers for your goods and services, well, you you should essentially be liable for these, right? So if you're buying advice off someone, well, they should be able to come back or whatever you have, or someone else should, right? So All right, name, or... your name slash contact, somebody else is going to end up with those and then they're going to come after you. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> we, we've got to clear our debts. I'll give you guys just another minute to write, write your names on the back if you would. You don't, you don't have to write what it is you're selling on there. You'll just tell the person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Raise your hand if you're ready. If you're ready. Ready, ready. I can see that big hands. Okay, I'm waiting, waiting. You should get some too, yeah. Yeah. Your goal in this session right now is to basically buy and sell as much as you can. And, and feel free to like call out like what is it you're selling, you know, try to get some clients. Okay. So everyone started should have started with 30. And you know, who did we trust to make sure that was true? We had some sort of central bank here that was issuing money to everybody. Okay, so everyone started with 30 of these vouchers. They were vouchers for your goods and services, right? And you were trading with, with each other. So that ultimately, they should be claims against you as a business. Okay, this is this is our demo for kind of what we do in, in Kenya. In reality, in Kenya, we it's it's a group of businesses. So what would be on the back of them would be the endorsement of that business network. And generally, those are registered as like community-based organizations in Kenya as as a, as a collective. So everyone's starting there. So let, let's hear so who who thinks they are the richest in the room right now. Anybody? So count your money. Who's got who's got more than thirty? Raise your hand if you have more than thirty. Okay. Who's got more than forty? More than forty. Who's got more than fifty? <laughs> Who's got more than 60? 70? Okay, okay. How much you got, Kim? How much you got? 70. 70, okay. So Kim, Kim's up here. Right, and I'm sure we've got quite a few people along the way. Does anyone have none? Fenny. So, Fenny's down here. Uh, actually, sorry, we started there. So Fenny, Fenny's actually going to be negative in our chart. Right? All right, so here's our zero down here. So what does that mean? You know, and, and, and how are we sort of like duplicating regular economics with this, right? Like we've, we've experienced some inequality now in the room, but these are, these are claims. So Kim, 
Uh, who, whose money do you have there? Do you, um, have, do you have anybody in particular? I have Fenny. Okay, Fenny's. there she is. Yes. So, <laughs> Kim's got some of Fenny's money, right? What, what, what are you offering, Fenny? Bad legal, legal advice. Yeah, okay. You <laughs> never said it was bad. <laughs> so, so what happens in this case where, where she's, she's gotten a credit by the community, and nobody wants to go and buy back for her, or maybe she's refused them, you know? Like, so what happens in that, in that situation? How do we clear these credits, right? And so this has been the sort of one of the challenges of uh, these systems for forever, where you create a closed system, people start circulating these, you create some sort of, you agree on a credit line with people, um, and if there's no real collateral here, there's like, what's, what's actually backing, backing this? So, you know, if it's just this social commitment, do we have a way to take Fenny to court? Probably not, right? Maybe we could go to her house and, and try to take some stuff out of it, but you know, that's not the situation you want to be in, right? Like, we don't want to have to go to Fenny's house and start finding whatever you know, value that she's sort of extracted from the community that she's de defaulted on. And so this, this ends up being a, a huge, huge challenge. Um, you know, we try to solve it with social mechanisms, but this can also cause a lot of traffic jams. You know, like, Kim's got a lot of money. Well, what happens when Kim leaves town, or, and he, maybe he takes some of that money so it's not moving anymore, right? Or we have a lot of people, a few people way up here, and you end up with a lot of these imbalances, okay? And, um, so, you know, it's nice that there's currency for these communities, but you see a lot of the same kind of problems. Um, so I just, you know, what pops to your mind, uh, you know, who's, who's issuing these? How would multiple issues, issuers even know about each other? How would they develop relative pricing? So if you imagine like, if, you know, me as the central bank here printing these out and issuing them fairly, well, maybe you trust me to, to do that, but imagine you've got 16 or 30 of these issuers within a region. How would that work? And so, what we're really trying to do in Kenya is like, I, I don't want to be the central bank. I don't want to be the trusted party for this. We want to create a system that's much tr more trustless, right? Um, and so uh, we need systems of price discovery and guarantees and collateral. How would you put on-chain collateral? How would you put something that is a guarantee so that, you know, even if Fenny leaves the system and you're holding those bills, so their claims against Fenny, let's say, but could they also be claims against something else? And so we're, we'll talk about about like actually the idea of staking die into these systems, which is something that we've, we've already started doing. Um, and and also, you know, with paper, um, obviously printing paper, I would never recommend it to anyone. It's not fun. Um, you know, yeah, go ahead. These values here, ten, five, are they yeah. uh, like national currency? It's, so there's a soft peg to the national currency, right? Excuse me. It's a, a soft peg in a soft sense. Peg. With with these, like you know, like there is no there is no pool of money behind these, right? We're just calling them vouchers for Kenyan shillings, right? So uh, you know, there's a there's a big but challenge in terms to of that. prices. People would recognize this, like. They would usually they would use them as mixed pricing. Usually they would they're mixed as in like um, whatever's whatever you don't have in shillings, this is your top up. So that's the most common use case is is as a top up. Um, and then I, it just on these bills you'll see expirations as well. So every year we actually have we put a little stamp on there that says it expires. And if you want to keep using your vouchers, you've got to come back to the group with as much as you got in the first place, and then they get, you just get the next stamp on your on your vouchers. If you have more than you started with, they'll only stamp those that they gave you. So it's sort of a credit clearing at the end of the year, right? We want everyone to kind of come back to level. So we try to put in those mechanisms. So it, it, this this the the idea is called. Uh, stamp script and it was uh, popularized like in Austria post-world war and uh, there was a mayor that started issuing these and he would accept them as tax credit and for the, the local um, uh, like bus services and it really took off and, and really circulated extremely fast and it was outlawed by the national government <coughs> in a few months um, or no I think it, it, it circulated for like two years um, and so the, the idea of stamp, stamp script is just to basically tell people like um, this it, it needs to move, right? So it's sort of helping facilitate that credit clearing process. 
You know, like if, if Kim stays with these for too long, they don't do them any good. Right? So there's a lot of monetary design that can go into the currency themselves, and we can also put that sort of stuff on a you know, smart contract. Um, so we've got uh, 3.7 billion people are so not connected to the internet. So how are they going to use the blockchain? And we'll get into more of just the blockchain in general. But um, 2.5 billion of those at least live with a 3G or 4G signal. So there's a huge, huge population that has access to phones, right? And, and these are mostly, in our case, it's like little Nokia push button phones. And so there's this thing called unstructured supplementary service data. It's an interactive menu-based technology and it's supported on almost all mobile devices. And it looks a bit like this. You dial up what's, what's called like a short code and we, we have a server sitting there on the telecom that's waiting for the result of this menu-driven uh, system. So they can do, a, I'll show you some examples. This isn't actually what the layout looks like, but they can do things like we have a, we have a marketplace. So they, they can access their wallet, um, you know, look at their balances, they can do transactions, um, they can look at a directory, they can actually enter in what it is they want to sell. Um, we do have a little ranking system, which I'll show you in a, in a second, so that, because, you know, we're really limited in characters, so, um, we can only show like the top four of each marketplace category. So there's, you could say, I want to look for food, and it'll show you that day who are the top users of uh, businesses accepting. Um, yeah, I, I call this, I mean, it's a, it's a centralized stepping stone in a way. I mean, there's, there's a lot of um, <coughs> ideas where we want to have this completely decentralized. We want them to be able to manage their own keys. That just doesn't seem practical, at least for the time being. Um, I, these are some examples of actual users. We've got Maasai guys who have little solar panels that they stick in their hair sometimes. And, um, they're trading goats, you know, and things like that. It's, and so here's so USSD coming in. We've got an AWS. And this is really simplistic. And actually, so Nick from Sempo is going to talk more about this after this. This idea. Um, and then we're pushing out to a, a side chain right now. We've been using these proof of authority uh, based systems and, and XDAI has the DAI built into it. It's a, it's a um, hard spoon so there's, and, and it's, it's uploaded to Ethereum so it's, it's backed up on Ethereum. So we have the security of Ethereum but the, the cost for this is almost nothing. It's like a, a ten thousandth of a cent to do a transaction on, on that so we can do as many as we want and they can clear in real time so this is you know I, I basically send a signal to you I say I'm going to trade with you and both parties get a receipt within about a second maybe you know up to five seconds and so that's and the receipt is just an SMS coming back to both parties so what we do today we we are still in this process so grassroots economics is going in on you know either behalf of a donor or when communities call us in, we go in and do a training and we, we mint that token for them. And we, we create an amount that's basically based on that population right now. This is some of the stuff we're trying to get away from, where we, we want them to self-generate their own tokens and manage them themselves. So we're building those systems so that they can do all that work themselves. And our work is just going in and doing sensitization and training. Um, so yeah, again, we're doing this, this airdropping for new users, and then we also get donors involved. And food security is one thing, but there's quite a few other categories where we have uh, donors that are already putting money into those communities, and we're trying to get them to change how they put their money into the community based on some parameters of how the community is using that money. So it's giving donors a way to, to actually get you know, parameters or, or uh, impact measurements in those communities. So, Savings and loan groups and other key businesses, like I showed you the schools, like what, what you know, what's your, what's the backing? You know, it's a guarantee against what? So, you know, the, there's still that, you know, there's a huge need for that social backing to be there. Um, and then all these community currencies are now exchangeable with each other as well. And so we'll go into like, what is those mechanisms? Um, we're also getting into the point where they're exchangeable to national currency. So the ability to put collateral take national currency, let's say from a donor or from the savings groups itself, they can put that, they basically can buy die with it, they can stake that die into a reserve, and that, that gives the, these local currencies the ability to uh, essentially cash out and in. Um, and we have automated conversion between tokens. So each user right now, when they go into the system, they choose their community token 
Um, and whenever a foreign token comes into their wallet, it automatically converts into their own token. And that actually creates price imbalances between the communities. And we'll, we'll go into that a little bit. And, and again, we're using POA, it's a sidechain. Yeah, okay, so I, we're not going to go too much into the math here, but the, the idea is that your price of your token is based on two things. Um, reserve, so what's, what's actually behind it? So we're in the situation now where um, we're just starting to connect this to DAI, right? So if you've got DAI in reserve, and let's say I have $25,000 of DAI, for instance, and I create a supply of $100,000, right? Um, so I've got a 25% here, you can imagine, right? Um, so my reserve ratio uh, is 25%. If I choose an F, so F is a target reserve ratio. So if I say F is one, so when I create this smart contract, I say, okay, we have a standard on what we're gonna allow for oops, that's a too much. Um, the reserve ratio to be. And so basically, well, let's look at it this way. So, so imagine, here's this example where we've got a, pri a price of one to one with a reserve at a point. So here's what we want to do. We want to be able to create currency. We love the idea of this sort of social backing. It's very nice, but it breaks down quite easily. So we want a, a way of putting actual collateral into the system. We don't have enough DAI to give everyone, right? And people just don't have enough money in general. So we need to like be able to create more money. And it's sort of irresponsible to do that with just pure social backing. It's really hard for a group, especially as those groups try to expand out. It ends up being something that you know may work with a dozen businesses well, that know each other well, speak the same language, but as those start to scale and grow out, it breaks down really, really quickly. And so I've, you know, doing this for 10 years with paper currencies, you know, groups of, you know, 100 to 200 businesses, that's about it. I, the scaling beyond that, not so easy. So we've created dozens of these currencies all over Kenya. Now the question is, well, how do we bring them together? Is there a mechanism to, to allow them to trade with each other? But also, how do we allow them to put real collateral into those systems and, and leverage? So, you know, Red Cross, again, is, is uh, pumping money into these, into these communities already. Um, and generally, that money just leaks right, the back, right, right out. And um, can we have them instead put that money into these reserves is the idea. So just looking at this graph again, so imagine you've got a total reserve for your, to so you're a token creator now in the community, or you could be a group of businesses that come together that are doing savings, say. And you've got a reserve of, of Kenyan shillings. There's there e-money in Kenya, so we have an interface that goes directly from that same USSD menu, so to deposit into their own savings account, that is in DAI. So this DAI, so here's your DAI that's locked into this contract. And then we're going to mint four times that in tokens. So if, if you've got a 25% reserve ratio, you've got four times the leverage, is the idea. So we've created a whole bunch of tokens here. And we say that they're one-to-one -one with each other. In other words, every one of my tokens so if I, if, if I started with uh, 25,000 die, now I have 100,000 die, that's what I'm saying, that, that they're one to one. It's not die anymore, it's my die, right? It's, it's, it's my token, they name it themselves, so it's their credit, essentially. It's a credit against some, some reserve. So they've, we've minted money here. And that's just, what's really exciting about this is we need something like $2.5 trillion in the next like five years if we want to do any of these activities that the UN is specifying under like the Sustainable Development Goals, like to deal with refugee issues. Um, and that's also the same size as the World Bank's uh, uh, quoted credit gap. Like there's not enough credit in the world anyways uh, at all right now in terms of demand. So if communities have a means of creating their own credit and doing it safely with some actual collateral behind it, this could be the solution for that. And so that's that's the idea in terms of scaling all this stuff and working with Red Cross. And, um, Sempo, Nick, uh, is, is basically designing those interfaces right now of how to on and off ramp money in, in and out of these systems. So the, 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 I'm sure there's a lot of questions here. Like one is what, what happens when there's less and less reserve in that system? So let's say people start pulling out that reserve. Well, what happens is the price is going to drop down below. So if we said, okay, this is, this is essentially one-to-one -one with shillings, call it a die shilling, okay? 
So once it starts dropping below a shilling, so yeah, I have a token now that's that is only you know it's it's let's let's say we're down here at like we get down to that far point five. So people are starting to cash out. Okay. <clears throat> There's some mechanisms we can put in smart contract that limit how fast they can cash out. That can be a choice of the community. So actually, what we do in Kenya right now is that they can actually only cash out 10% of their their reserve or their their balance. So out of their supply, if they want to cash this out into into this, they only do 10% a week right now, and that's a choice with the community. So the idea is that's their reserve; they own it. It, they should feel as they're pulling that reserve out, their price is dropping and dropping. What does that mean? Well, it means there's an opportunity for the next community over here to buy into that community. So if I want to buy her tomatoes and I'm in another community and I see that my currency is now more valuable compared to hers, there's this sort of arbitrage opportunity. And if I go and buy from her with my tokens from my community, basically the reserve behind mine Actually, when she converts it to hers, which happens automatically, it, that reserve goes into her currency and it brings that price back up. So there's a price stability among the communities when that, when that happens. And there's also an opportunity for me to go in, or for her to say, well, I, I can actually use my shilling now, or a donor could come in and say, I can use my dollar and shilling and I have more purchasing power with it. Right? So for one shilling now, I'm going to get more tokens out. Does that make sense? So that drives it back up. And so we're depending on basically two things. We're depending on markets between communities in terms of that sort of market arbitrage. We're also depending on the market in and out of, of the Kenyan shilling to stabilize those prices. And, and this curve, uh, <coughs> this curve, the shape of this curve depends on that reserve ratio. Okay. And so right now we, we've actually been using 25%. Um, Quite a bit here, and we've got 12 communities trading with each other, and they've all been very stable with respect to each other. How long has that been? What's that? How long is that? How long has it been stable? We've been doing this for about a year and a half now, and the the biggest fluctuation I've seen um, was about like a <clears throat> 0 0.8 to a 0 0.2, or uh, uh, sorry, a 1.2 in terms of price gap, and that <clears throat> those tend to clear within about a month of each other. So it's, it, I mean, it's really interesting to look at those oscillatory effects. So, and there's also this sort of like concept of negative feedback. Is it, is it die? <laughs> the, the collateral is die, not either, right? Yeah. yeah. That's the idea, yeah. yeah. So if the... Uh, no, no, it's, no, it's Right now, it's, it's just pure cash. In fact, so I have a top level token. So instead of the um, DAI, we just have a, a, a temporary token that's not connected to anything. And then I've got a bank account. And we're just, we're making that peg happen with the bank account, right? So we put we take that bank account, put it into e-money, and we just send it back and forth right now. And that's a, not a fun, not a fun process to do. And so um, eventually, that, that the whole interface for how this thing works uh, will just be through the local e-money systems. And then, <clears throat> like Nick is also working in a lot of areas where there's no, there is no e-money system. And so in that case, he's working with like local vendors that sort of act as the e-money. Maybe he can show, you might no, I'll, talk, I'll talk about it once. Maybe it's a good time to just show some, show some slides. <laughs> yeah, because this isn't working out. Right. Um, think about also, um, if, like the Fenny situation, like imagine Fenny leaves the community or no one can get anything from her, and let's say she was representing a, a whole token, okay? So this is a village, people are, are using a currency, but now all of a sudden like the main thing people were buying it, buying from it is gone, right? Like, like let's say the school breaks down or there's a, there's a huge drought and, um, or like the, the water source for one of these communities is completely gone. Um, well, people still have a claim against that reserve now, is the idea, right? So it's giving them some backing, and they can move that to the her community over here. So the price of Fenny's token is going to collapse, right? Her token's value is going to go up. If there's anything this community can offer, let's say maybe not now, but next month when they rebuild or something like this, well, they can use that money back at, at, in her community. And so this idea of like being okay with the idea that you know, like uh, the the value collapsing completely doesn't have to be 
be a, a bad thing because it means that those people move their reserves somewhere else. And, you know, like, I think tokens should be able to fail. I don't think that's a bad thing. And, and if there's a community of tokens, of currencies, then that creates, a, you know, a market where, where things can be more stable. Um, before you said that there was uh, a need for, like, a kind of social backing, like the school where people yeah. would uh, be, like, the buyer of last resort for their respective communities, right? Yeah. Um, does having a reserve reduce the pressure on uh, that like main social backer? Yeah, definitely. And there's so there's like a buffer now. You know? right. So like, if the school has accepted as much as they really want to at that point, then you know like the people always have the option of cashing out. And it, as they start cashing out, that does start dropping the price, and it also gives an incentive for other people to start putting more money back into the system. Um, and so like you really, you know, I, I don't think we're ever. It, I mean, uh, with tokens in general, like you, you, there needs to be something behind it, right? And even if that's, um, you know, the, like the savings of these groups, they're actually saving in these currencies as well. So they have a savings in the national currency, right? That goes into their collateral, but they actually demand savings also in the local currency. And so that creates a demand as well. And they actually, uh, these, these groups of women will loan it to each other as well, and they charge interest that uh, goes back into the group itself, so it's not really extractive interest like, a, like you would have with banks. And so that also creates some pressure and demand. And we've had some municipalities um, accepting them for, um, like there's a daily business uh, fee for, for going to some of these marketplaces. And so like, if there's any demand for it at all, then as long as, you know, if that price starts to drop down, well there, there's always a point at which it's, it's worth it to buy back in because you Need to pay for that thing, whatever it is. Uh, churches have started using these a lot for for like tithings. Um, uh, mosques are using them for like zakat at the end of the year during Ramadan, and um, they see it as like a. But they, they don't charge interest on there. So different groups use them in totally different ways, and I I can't even tell you what half of those ways are. I mean, we've got a lot of grad students and researchers who come out of those communities. So, but yeah, this the the idea of having you know, backing is, is uh, I think, super important. I, to me, why the community currency movement over the last, like, 30 years, it's been a very social movement, but it's also been very, like, isolating. Generally, they, never, they don't connect to each other, they don't connect to national currency at all, and there's this sort of wall, you know, like, we don't need your currency. You know, there's a remote down there. Oh, really? It's, it's here. here. It's here. Yeah. I think the team just died. I um, what I can just do is I can just put my laptop in the middle of the room. Yeah. It's a little bit small. But if there's savings in the community, what's the average saving per community as far as a whole? Yeah, so like they'll save up to something like, like a group is like 25 women. So even within one quote unquote community, you could have many, many of these groups. And generally you have like maybe a dozen of these savings groups. Um, and they are saving like one to two dollars a uh, a week per person, and they get up to something like two hundred dollars in total. Oh, sorry. So, so generally, having a pool of two hundred dollars, they start loaning that out in general. So, what we're doing is just saying, well, hey, you guys can also start to leverage the savings that you have into more credit because you know, as much as the whole savings thing has been amazing across Africa, like these these tabletop banks have actually done amazing work. And like Catholic Relief Services is one of these groups that have created a, a thing called Silk. Which is savings and internal lending um, cooperatives, and uh, they they do really amazing work, and they do they do it all with uh, um, these like three choir notebooks that they cut with like razor blades. And they're really amazing, and uh, I, I'm super impressed with them. Really, what was the name of that? Catholic Catholic Relief Services has developed this thing called Silk. Yeah, which is worth looking. They have a training manual, and it's been, it's gone really viral because. Those groups go and train the next groups, and they, they get paid by the, the next group to basically be the, the auditor of that group, the, the trusted party. And what we've been doing is just, they, so they use, they can use national currency, they can use M-Pesa, and now they can also leverage, so we're just adding a tool to their tool set right now, and that's how we've been spreading as well. Is this possible to like supplement the programs that Give Directly does? So if I was to donate, uh, rather than to give directly, directly, <laughs> um, you would give it to the reserves of the community that can then leverage it as an internal yeah. credit unit. That's wow. totally the idea, and 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 be able to use the data for your decision. So yeah. 
you know, when, we, or like, let's say Red Cross is, is <coughs> seeing that there's a drought coming, that's a time now to start, start feeding that, that, that reserve, like, give it more value. And they could also look at metrics like if you, you want to support education, and, and everyone's also got a wallet, so you could just give to them to, uh, individually. No, I really love that you write that one because it's like the end goal. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Um, just, to, just so I can like tailor this presentation, who was here yesterday for my Oxfam talk? Okay, so not too many. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of overlap just to cover some of the stuff. Some of the people. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> Um, so, my name's Nick and I'm the co-founder of SEMPO. Um, SEMPO is really focused on creating payments infrastructure and savings infrastructure to create financial inclusion in exactly the sort of markets that um, Will is talking about. So, one way of looking at us is that I mean, we're just another payments route, um, which is kind of cool in the first place, but what I really love about what we're doing is that it really dives deep into like sort of token economics here. So, it's a lot more than just a regular payment system, it's about really Sitting in those frameworks in place to really set up entire new ways of, of like making infrastructure work inside communities from the ground up and re reimagining a lot of that. And I think that this time we're living right now is really exciting because this is really the first time that anyone would actually seriously able to produce <laughs> doing these sorts of like alternative like financial systems inside communities without people like going just nuts about it uh, because of the nature of what decentralization brings to the capacity to create new equity models. Um, so this is Vanuatu. Um, I just got back from working in Vanuatu. Uh, it's a collection of 87 islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. They're some of the most isolated islands on the planet and also some of the most um, disaster prone. So we get volcanoes. This is uh, Tanna Volcano, uh, which is just super cool. I should show you a video of it. Uh, <laughs> and, and they have typhoons and all those sort of things. So, one of the nature of these, but by having these isolated islands, is that banking infrastructure is basically non-existent uh, because it's just too expensive when you have these little small um, populations dispersed across islands to actually put um, bank branches on each island. So there's actually more people with a volcano on their landmass than there is with a bank on their landmass. So there's more people who are volcano than there are banks, uh, which is just like phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get made, you get lava. Um, so this is like something makes like the sort of things that Will is facing and if you wanted to get cash to people really, really challenging. And so what we do is because of the magic of the internet, we basically set up these entirely digital networks inside communities. Um, where we have we give people payment cards or mobile phone based digital payments. Um, and it allows people to spend things at local stores. And then we can set up payment links with the stores themselves because it's a lot easier to get cash to stores who tend to have a higher level of financial inclusion than it is to get money to sort of to set up payments directly to individuals in terms of fiat on ramps and off ramps. Um, so that's the space we're playing in on top of these sort of token economics that we've been talking about. Um, this has like a whole bunch of problems when you actually try and do this in practice though, because once again we're talking about some really remote and quite uh, isolated communities. Sorry, are these islands part of uh, some large nation? Or yeah, Vanuatu. Vanuatu is a nation. Vanuatu. Okay. Um, it is. Let me see if I have a real old presentation. Give me two seconds. Uh, Raise your hand if you've ever heard of that country. <laughs> I didn't know about it yet. Yeah. Or... Yeah. 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 I'll show you show where it is on that. So that's where it is. It's like literally this little scattered set of islands, um, and this is what this is what the city crime communities look like. They're like highly sparse islands. Yes. So. The classic problem we face is this sort of internet penetration. Um, just to give you an idea of what the communities actually look like, these are the sort of places that these islands have. So there's not necessarily a high amount of internet penetration. Um, what we've found is actually a really common failure mode is that there is going to be three or four gene networks, but they're going to be, these communities are sort of right on the fringes. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced like the patch connection. What we find is really common in practice is that you, you ostensibly have internet, but 
it, you know, it will be there for like five minutes and it will be gone for five minutes. It's not an all or nothing thing. So you have, you know, you sit there and you send an SMS and then, you know, mm -hmm. forget that you sent an SMS and five minutes later it goes whoop and you're like, what was that? Um, <laughs> it's like it's your SMS sending. Um, and so this is like kind of okay for a lot of things that are like synchronous or asynchronous sort of actions that we go through. Like trying to send an email is actually you know, pretty okay when you have only questionable internet. But it really does break down for a lot of payment processes because payments is something that you don't really have the privilege of going away um, and saying, hey, trust me, the, the money will come in 10 minutes. People need a guarantee on the spot uh, because it's an in-person interaction. Um, so we really need something that's really quite responsive. Um, and so what we actually do, one of the things we've worked on inside communities is actually using contactless payment cards. Um, the reason we use these is we do a little bit, of, we take a little bit of centralization into our process, but it allows us to basically store um, data and balance on side the cards um, in such a way that we can cache transactions on the mobile phones themselves um, and then put through the payments at a later stage. Um, and so the main challenge here, as you might imagine, is just the risk of a double spam attack. Um, because if, you, if you're making a payment at one store and then you go to another store and neither of those stores are connected to internet um, right at this very moment and they're storing their transactions to make later, um, how can you be certain that you know, the person hasn't actually just spent all of their money at the previous store and now when you're accepting a payment from them, they've got no money left. Um, the great thing about these cards is that they've got secure hardware on them. It's not full cryptographic hardware, but it's hard to tamper with because it's a chip inside a card. Um, so what we actually do in order to like prevent a double spend attack on the local level is that we record the balance on the card at any given time. And the balance consists of basically two items. Your balance consists of the amount of money that you had loaded onto the card in total, minus minus the amount of money that you've had subtracted off the card in total. So if you had $10, you spent five of it, or three of it, let's make it, your remaining balance is seven. Um, but of course, the big challenge of these sort of processes is that you don't want um, people to be able to basically reverse their card and roll back in time. Um, so we record the balances, these two numbers. The first one, the amount loaded on, um, is verified using a signature. Um, that's basically, um, this, the um, vendor will have a list of trusted testers. Um, and so when the person goes and tops up their card at any point in time, um, a signature is loaded on, um, attesting to that balance. Um, there could be any one of um, delegated organizations that actually set the balance for all those communities. Um, and then when they go and make the payment, we actually use a one-way counter on the card that is incremented um, that can't be rolled back. So that means we can be pretty certain of what the balance is on these cards at any point in time. Um, and it means that when you go to a store, the um, vendors know the cards aren't going to be out of date. Um, so that's some of the things we're sort of framing in that sort of community. One of the biggest challenges we've actually found um, or if it's traditionally an issue with sort of setting up payment networks, at least inside communities, is regulatory capture, um, which is basically the process of existing incumbents regulating any, um, you know, competitors out of the market. Um, this is something that, like Facebook is really facing right now. Um, so I'm going to, I think it's like super interesting. I think it's like something that isn't discussed enough is M-Pesa. Um, it's like this fascinating story of payment mechanisms. So who here has heard of M-Pesa? Okay. Um, who here knows like how M-Pesa works? Kind of? Okay. So I'll, I'll go through it. M-Pesa's origin story is like sort of one of my like favorite origin stories out there. I don't know how much this is true versus something that was sort of manufactured after the fact. Um, but I like it anyway, so I'm going to tell it and pretend it's true. Um, so basically M-Pesa just started off as this way of um, sharing SMS credits um, amongst communities. And I don't think there was a particularly strong hypothesis around like what this was necessarily supposed to be. Um, but in Kenya, the classic problem, it's a Kenyan product, the classic problem people used to face is that there's a high amount of sort of local remittances um, between communities. So you'll have people in like rural villages who send family members back to some of the large cities to actually make pay, um, earn money, uh, earn a living wage, and then send that money home. And the process of sending that money home, it was something of a chaotic process because there was no 
no money transfer mechanisms. So you either had a choice of getting on an eight hour bus ride yourself um, to send that money back in your backpack, or you could go through some sort of delegated private type process, like a wallet network, um, where you ask, basically ask someone to get on the bus and you can trust that maybe hopefully they give the money to your family and if they don't, well that's unfortunate, isn't it? Um, and so M pays a, while it's, what happened is it started this way of saying, sharing these SMS credits. But what people actually started to do is that you'd have these like basically informal kiosks that popped up on both sides in the city and in the, in the local communities. And someone realized that, say, Fanny is in the city and I'm a worker in the city, um, and you're in the village, uh, and I'm trying to get money to you, I could transfer my SMS, or I could buy, buy that, you know, five dollars. I might not even have a mobile phone. And I go, hey, Benny, can I buy five dollars of SMS credits off you? And she goes, okay, I'm going to you know, charge you ten cents for that. Um, and then she would send those five dollars of SMS credits to um, a kiosk in the village, who would then take a small fee of those SMS credits and then provide cash to my family member in like on the spot. So basically, this SMS credit transfer process was basically turned into a way of transferring money. Uh, even though it wasn't designed to. And uh, Vodafone noticed this and thought it was really, really cool and built some more infrastructure around it. And that basically resulted in this payment process that we have today. Um, and it subsequently ballooned just from a way of making informal businesses to a way of making payments. So now it's really, really common to see these sort of setups. And I'm sorry, the image is so blurry. Um, well, you have kiosks and they have these numbers. Uh, that's a little bit amazing, right? Yeah, so you can either send it to someone with their phone number or they can have a little agent number. And so, Kenya has a population of what, 50 million? Yeah, 50 million. Um, and it was an absolutely flying success there. So, um, 2014, more money was transferred in Sub-Saharan Africa than Europe and North America put together. Um, and another um, counterpart or counterpart of counterparty competitor um, of M Pesa. Yeah, <laughs> English is my first language. <laughs> um, MTM. Um, was also doing very well and decided to launch this into Nigeria. Um, but they didn't go through the process of uh, basically courting the Reserve Bank over there. And what happened in the Reserve Bank basically completely kicked them out of the um, community um, by charging them, they were fining them basically a million dollars a day. And this was a process of basically the incumbent banks basically forcing these communities, um, these existing um, income, um, what, telecom providers to um, play by their rules. And this is actually one of the most common causes of failure of um, like any sort of financial system moving into a country um, is just being forced out by existing incumbents who have the ear of whatever the regulatory authority is there. And it's something we've had to be pretty careful about. Um, when we went into that Oahu, cryptocurrency was actually banned outright. Um, and the reason was is because they had one of these sort of scams, the, I think it was the one coin scam recently, um, and the Reserve Bank was just like, oh, I don't know. Um, and so, one of the things we've just learned the hard way is that you just need to spend a ton of time before you even watch these things, just like speaking with authorities um, and setting expectations around what's going to happen, otherwise you lose your sort of space. Um, let's see there. Um, yeah, so sorry, this is one that I really like, but it's um, one that everyone yesterday has seen. Um, so, apologies for everyone. Um, yeah, so we built a lot of platform working uh, in northern Lebanon on the border of Syria. Um, this is a refugee camp of war camp, it's called the Camp of Akar. Um, it's in Akar province. This is a really, really, it's a tinderbox community. There's about 20,000 refugees for every 5,000 locals. Um, so the population split is just completely reversed, um, which makes it really, really interesting. Um, we built a lot of our Android app while working over here. Um, and we went into this pin off system that we thought was really going to work really, really well. Um, so you have your card, you touch it to the back of the phone, and the payment will go through. What we found when we got there was that there was an existing cash based payment process in place um, that was using debit MasterCards that had been distributed to refugees. So, um, and what had happened was that refugees were actually writing their pins on the back of their cards, <laughs> <laughs> handing this across to um, recipients, um, handing this to the vendors who would check 
their cards um, and then make the payment. What's super fascinating about this, and this is something I didn't cover yesterday, um, but it's why I think it's like the interesting part about this, is the reason this breaks down, the, re like the problem that actually arises here, isn't one of security. Um, the communities we're working with, like the concept of like what would happen if your card was stolen, um, wasn't something that was super you know, prevalent and super concerning to these communities. Um, what actually caused the, the real breakdown that happened as a consequence of this was that the entire control over the payment flow actually swapped over from where you check your how much is being paid and then answer your pin to being controlled entirely by the vendor. And what this meant was that vendors were basically able to enter any amount into the um, payment terminal and then confirm it before the recipient or the person making the payment could even check the amount. <laughs> so the pin wasn't even a pin so much as preventing security. The, the key function of the pin in this case, and I think it's probably true in a lot of societies, is actually just to make sure that you have like the process is forcing uh, the recipient to be able to check the balance uh, before they make a payment. Uh, so we actually spoke to uh, oh yeah this one's cool. Uh, I'll jump to the solutions in a sec. But I think this is really this is a really fascinating example because we talk about our system being based on Arabic peoples, uh, but this is what actually Arabic peoples look like. Um, <laughs> they're pretty much foreign, so if you're forced to like, if, imagine if you were someone who was literate or didn't understand the local number set, it'd be like asking you guys to try and remember a pin that looks like this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it just doesn't work. Um, so, some alternatives have been played with. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we actually did was we spoke to a lot of refugees, and in Lebanon, um, Mobile phone penetration amongst communities is smartphone penetration is actually close to 100%. And recipients all taught us the same thing. It was very much, the language was very much focused around this problem that I said that it wasn't that we want to have security because we don't feel safe about our pins. It was we want to be able to check and confirm the payment before it goes through. The last thing we want is, when we're talking about low literacy people, is a very big number that says how much we're about to pay um, and then and, and then a tick or a cross um, to make that payment. So it's actually what we implemented. This is a lady who has actually had learning difficulties, um, so really struggled with like regular literacy. Um, she's scanning a QR code that's generated by the vendor in the store, um, and then the payment would come up, the check would cross, and the payment would go through. One thing we learned about making in-store payments in this process, and it comes back to that internet connectivity thing, is that you really don't have the luxury of a lot of time when you're actually working to actually let the payment go through. Um, and this is something that really struggles when we're talking about decentralized finance. Um, I, at my best guess, is around after about more than, so like we talk about like 10 seconds, not being like you know, 10 or 15 seconds, not being an awkwardly long time to wait for a payment. But if I was to stand here for like 15 seconds, it would probably be excruciatingly, excruciatingly awkward for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, seven seconds and I'm done. <laughs> so the point is, is that like these payment processes need to happen really quick. Even looking at something like POA um, and the confirmation time on that, it just doesn't work fast enough. Um, and so this comes back to a lot more of this sort of optimistic settlement and why we had to do it at that sort of speed, um, which is something that sort of got us through a lot of that process. Um, uh, yeah, this one's super interesting. Um, so we talked about, you know, basically trying to make repayments to vendors. Um, what we found is that most vendors don't actually have access to a bank account at all. So repaying a lot of the vendors became subsequently impossible as well. Um, and so we actually basically set up these almost borderline shadow banking processes. <laughs> um, where? Never mind. Um, where we actually had some large vendors in the community who had liquidity in their own rights um, that we could actually use to pay back to smaller of the vendors. So this is Lloyd, she's one of the vendors we worked with Vendor Country, and she had she had a larger throughput of money inside her community. Um, and so was able to act as that buffer. So smaller vendors would actually come and when they needed to cash out, they'd actually go to her, transfer their DAI credits over to that vendor and then receive money back. Um, one of the challenges around this is when we think of banks, 
like we think of them as like in, in the absence of like total economic failure as basically having like cash on one hand, right? Um, we don't think of like a bank run being like a very real problem um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Like you kind of when you go to an ATM, you expect it to be pretty irregular for them to have enough physical cash to pull out. Um, in the communities, when you start to use sort of a shadow banking process, um, liquidity becomes like this really, really like constant challenge. And you hear stories of like it is totally normal for like these sort of micro vendors to actually just run out of money on a day to day basis. So people have this expectation of like trying to cash out and then maybe they'll be able to do it on that day, or maybe not to. Um, maybe they won't be able to because the vendor just doesn't have any cash on them at that stage. And so one of the things we've had to battle with a lot is once you've actually started to use like a distributed network for payments is actually ensuring that all the elements of the system actually have enough liquidity to do these cash, these cash outs. Um, and this is something I think is really exciting about like starting about swapping to entirely digital processes so that you can actually start to you know, liquidity becomes less of an issue. Um, but um, you were talking about how like $10,000 billion, thousand shilling notes basically were like impossible to get rid of. Yeah, yeah. So ten dollars there is the highest denominated bill, and if you walk around with that in a typical village or slum, like you're going to spend probably an hour, maybe you know, like trying to break that into smaller, smaller bits. And usually it involves like you would pay her for it, and she'd be like, "Hold on a second and then she'd just leave her shop, and like she would come back in like maybe 10, 20 minutes. It, you know, you hope she comes back. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, actually, the worst thing is like, if you're my, my tip to you, if you're a foreigner in Kenya, like, if you can carry around change, definitely do it because you won't get that bill back quite often. You know? uh, so I think that's everything I got in terms of like the challenges we have sort of faced. Um, is there any questions? Yeah. Um, I, I've actually worked on a project to try to implement. Um, MPES actually, because after it was acquired by Vodafone, they started rolling out <coughs> in developing communities. Yeah. Um, but it was in Eastern Europe, and uh, it wasn't really that popular, mainly because, um, well, at least so I heard, in uh, Kenya, it was popular because uh, carrying large amounts of cash was also a security concern, <coughs> while carrying a large amounts of cash in Europe is. Not yeah. Right. Um, and one of the uh, aspects is that like people are just used to having physical cash for settlements, and mm. like there are some countries in which like the access to cash is very prevalent, mm. but there's still additional benefits. For example, like you have cash, but you can't pay your mortgage in cash. Yeah. Right. So they try to actually implement systems in which like to try to uh, facilitate digital payments, to increase access to credit, mm. and additional banking services. Um, but kind of like what's the relationship essentially between um, certain communities and their ability and willingness to go the digital route versus like, yeah. Yeah, so one of my favorite stories in the Pacific Islands is when someone, a organization tried to implement mobile money in the Solomon Islands. Um, and what we found is like, there's something really critical about the physicality of things because the physicality of things represents their existence in many ways. Um, and this organization basically got the messaging around mobile money like just completely got it wrong. Um, and what they found was that like there's these stories of these people who would go to their like local vendors who had the cash and could act as these liquidity points and say, here's my you know MPazer account. I'd like to withdraw all my money. And so they withdraw all their life savings, they'd sit there, they'd count it all, and they go, okay, put it all back in place. Um, <laughs> and it's just because they wanted, they wanted to be convinced that like this physical cash actually existed. Um, and so <laughs> this is a classic example of that breakdown. Um, but at least they put it back in. Yeah. That's the crazy thing, because the communities that I worked in, they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Which is actually because they experienced hyperinflation within their lifetime. So like they would take it out yeah. and they would literally bury it. Yeah, so, so this is their house. this is so the the num Vanuatu recently introduced plastic banknotes. Yeah. Uh, um, and everyone said the best thing about new plastic banknotes is you can bury them in the ground for longer without them rotting. Um, <laughs> that is the revolution in banknotes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I mean these are like 
it really comes down to like I think like even Japan is this classic example of I me, mean, where this is still very much like a cash-based economy, um, and I I would be loath to talk about like what what single defining factor is like sets whether this thing is going to work or not. It's you know far too complex. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it also has to do with the telecom provider. Yeah. Just like for example in in, in Zimbabwe, you have EchoNet which has Echo Cash, mm -hmm. and that does okay. But, you know, in Kenya, Safaricom is basically the government. <laughs> I mean, like, it's huge, it's massive, and, and, and they control everything in so many ways. So it just depends in, in countries where the government is less um, influential than the government, than the businesses, you, you know, I think that dynamic is really, is really important. I think the other thing is, is that, like, I mean, this is like all digital, digital, financial literacy things and all banking, like trying to bring everyone on to like being banked. It, is, it all comes back to like, what's what's the value proposition actually for the news? Like having money in its digital form is not a value proposition in its own right, right? Doesn't, just because something's now ones and zeros instead of this, it doesn't make it better. And what the number one reason that like Kenya worked is because it was solving this problem of like geographic boundaries. Right? People hated the process of like taking money from like their local, like getting money back to their local communities. And this is something we've found in the Pacific as, as well. Like the single, there's about three things we've noticed like determines people's payments, um, like how they choose providers. Uh, number three is cost. Number two is like trust. Um, how much do you know? Do your family members recommend this payment provider versus this one? The number one thing that actually determines like choice of payment provider is locality. Uh, people just for very good reason cannot be valid to drive four hours to their bank, right? So if you're in a community, if you're in these like concentrated you know, European communities where you've got an ATM around the corner or you know there's like geographically everything's quite concentrated, then this motivation of oh I don't you know I can get cash out like right now is suddenly a lot stronger or like the need for like providing a digital process just isn't there as much anymore because you don't need to worry about how to move the money a lot. Actually, uh, I live in Germany. Recently I saw a um, uh, use of the exact news report about rural Germany. Uh, they have these, the, the folks bought cash in a car with an ATM driving around because they had to close down all these ATMs. <laughs> it's <because> fascinating. <laughs> they're, they're actually too costly to yeah. operate. Um, and that's in a country which is also very cash driven, so maybe this is not even an emerging economy's uh, yeah. you know, a unique problem. I wanted to ask though about the privacy concerns of all this. Is that just kind of a first world problem and do you have to give it up in these situations? Especially in PESA, right? The moment that it turns into an actual payment uh, facilitator, that means that the cell phone companies knows every single transaction that you did, yeah. and that's a pretty risky pool of information right there. Yeah, this is like, I mean, this is something that we, we're we still working on, um, because we can do an anonymous link between a, an individual and their die account, but the reality is, is like, the die account is a full network, right? You can see every single transaction that's gone in there, because we're not missing the money or anything like that. Um, and so, it's some, yeah, it's, it's something that I think is like an unresolved problem for us. It's like how you ensure this is like as private as possible and how you reach those balances. Um, one of the things we've found is that one of the big selling points that allows us to get around this regulatory, regulatory challenge is that reserve banks are just, especially in the Pacific Islands, <coughs> like just totally terrified of being blacklisted by like, like International revenue, uh, government bodies for like inappropriate, you know, money laundering, etc., like architecture and stuff like that. So Vanu Marshall was actually on the EU blacklist until like a year ago because they were just too flippant with the way they were treating regulation. It was too easy for people to order money, um, and the blockchain makes this a lot easier. So it's like, how do you match like here's something from the government versus like what is good for communities? Exactly. I just wanted a supplement question to that. So yes. part of that, though, is like that you were talking about digital literacy, right? Yeah. But privacy literacy. Is there any literacy, or is it even relevant? Yes. To be no. To be relevant? So this is like super interesting. Um, interesting. Uh, Probably like a team. Um, and this is this is actually from the humanitarian space. Um, 
there's been these attempts to basically um, like what these communities offers, not worrying about it, not worried about it, but they absolutely understand the consequences of this. Um, and one of the reasons they like the cards is the beautiful thing about a contactless payment card or something like this is the only thing that is used to prove that it's yours is the physical possession of it. It can be that simple, which means that you don't have to have any other account information to prove that it's yours, right? If you have it, it's yours. That's how our wallets work, right? I don't need to have my name on a wallet with my money in it to walk into a store and pay for people for it. People really like this. And there's been a lot of cases in communities where um, some sort of biometric-esque process has been used. Um, so at the very simple, it's like taking a photo of someone. Um, and people find this really, really disturbing um, to see like when you go and make a payment, so we go, hang on, you have my face attached to this payment account. Um, and some NGOs have tried to basically say that you know people don't care about this because the usability is so much nicer. And the classic example, um, UNHCR uses biometrics to authenticate all of their sort of NGO level um, going into a store where you want to get your food, we'll scan your virus and we'll give you your food. Um, and they've said it's okay because the usability is all high, which is actually is right. If you don't need to remember a pin you know, like ID you buy your virus, it's great. But communities like uh, absolutely, they hate this because this, it's the Rohingya refugees. They're totally worried about this data being handed across to the, um, the, uh, the Myanmar government that have basically been you know, oppressed using this data. And the thing is, is that they don't really have a choice. Like, there's this concept of consent, and then there's like non coerced consent. So, if you're a person that like has no other good alternative to like how you're going to get your money, get your foods and vegetables, and people are like, well, you can either have your iris scanned or you can go and starve and die. Um, that's not really consent, right? That's, um, <laughs> that's just coercing someone into having their iris scanned. Um, and it's something that's just like, like shift, um, you know, put under the rug and said, oh, can you use okay with this? Then I'll be good enough to worry about this. And it's absolutely not true. Um, so it's something that's like, I think, yeah, I can use that. Um, probably you get this asked often, but with cash, like you can easily divide it so you don't have one point of failure so you can leave half your cash with your family and then go and go shopping but with a card you take it with you and if something happens to the card then all your money is gone basically yes so we actually where possible so when, when we've used these in the past we've used them for cash aid programs so what i mean is that it's money that's distributed on say a weekly basis it's not like no one has high value on these cards at any point uh, we follow Collectively, we follow the exact same process that you would have if you have to have a mobile account, which is the card is tied to one account, and then ideally you have a secondary account that is not directly tied to the card, and you have some highly authenticated way that is less user friendly of shifting money between the two um, where possible. But that once again requires some thresholds of literacy in terms of like how you authenticate things. Um, I, I think though you have to put some context around why you guys did the card because it was around emergency relief. Right? It's like, it wasn't so much that it was meant to be able to circulate within the community, it was tied to this kind of like, this, you know, volcanoes erupts, how do we get money quickly into the ground without having to spend time registering everybody after the peril, right? And, and, I, and I think that's, if it's something where they want to use as a community currency to circulate it, then you probably have a different system that you might think of or a different process. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, cards are great for community currencies like we were talking about because a card doesn't really what you want in community currency is for everyone to be able to act is basically both a consumer and or a buyer and a seller right because you're you're using you accept community currency in exchange for you know a goods and service and you go and purchase a different goods and service for someone else um, and a card is amazing like it's just a one-way flow right so it really doesn't work in all contexts um, any other um, sorry to hark back on the privacy issue as well, but um, for a cash donation project, you do have to kind of identify the individual, not necessarily through biometrics, but like it, it's definitely part of it. There, there's a whole registration process. Yeah. There's, so you do have to kind of create a digital identity to tie to the Ethereum account. <coughs> okay, let's play this game. This one's good. Well, it's not actually. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the the real question I had after this is the okay. fact that like, so you have a 
personally identifying information. Um, and then the second part is that, like, who runs the nodes of the side chains? Because you kind of manage the data, and if you have the ability to de-anonymize every account and anyone who has access to that internal side chain has, like, basically everyone's entire financial history. Yeah. Like, that's kind of, I was wondering, like, where does that that's data really actually good sit? Because yeah. um, it's that balance of, like, decentralization, but if you actually put it on mainnet, it's like, Broadcasting your financial history on Twitter right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm going to answer the first one first. Okay. Uh, well, I don't, there's actually not really a question there, but I'm going to yeah, answer no. anyway. <laughs> uh, So, we had real trouble actually doing like KYC on each individual. Um, and the most common reason we found about it well, actually, was just like people never spelled their name the same on the pieces of the document. It was just ridiculous. So, you. Uh, you couldn't actually get enough documentation for each individual to actually cross-check them enough to actually give them a full, like, KYC check. Um, and so, um, and like, even people's dates of birth differed by days, months, or even years um, between, you know, birth certificate and driver's licenses. Uh, this isn't like, you know, some nefarious plot by people to conceal identity from the government. It's just like the nature of, like, document keeping in these communities, right? Um, and it means that these sort of processes of like direct cash out just don't really work. Um, so what we actually do is we actually, we play a little game with the regulatory system. Um, and we actually create two, uh, we use DAI, because the DAI is like the store of value type inside the entire system. But we actually wrap that in a secondary token. And the secondary token um, includes a whitelist on it. Um, and so you can only, so when you have a secondary token, you can only convert that back into DAI, which is a fully, very, very liquid token, and if you're on that whitelist. Um, and so that whitelist is exclusively reserved for people who have KYC documentation. If you're not on the whitelist, you can still trade it with vendors on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we do KYC checks with the vendors, but then but you can't cash it out into money because we just don't know who you are. Um, and what I really like this is it's basically taking one token and making it mean two things to two different people depending on their level of verification. But it means fundamentally at the core, it means that we can safely give these tokens to people and we, we can have literally no idea who they are. Um, but because we know they can only spend it at these vendors who we are know are selling fruits and vegetables or clothing or something like that, not you know, anti-aircraft weapons. Um, I don't know where you're going to buy an aircraft weapon from a vendor. Um, it means that we avoid a lot of those debates around like whether this person's KYC or not, because now it's in the voucher rather than an actual piece of the currency or cryptocurrency. Um, so, um, I, I, this news story might actually have been about your work, but there was like a, a disaster, a natural disaster, some kind of like hurricane, and then all of a sudden there was like a massive community need, so that they decided to airdrop. Uh, like actual payments directly to a community that had this type of program implemented, right? Um, so is that possible only through KYC people? Um, or would you like have systems in which you kind of like, okay, we didn't get to everyone, but we have a trust system that says like, we have trusted parties that are able to kind of like do so it that's, for us. Well, so, so, what, yeah, so what we do is you, you airdrop the tokens to everyone the tokens of the actual cryptocurrency, and then you do, you do your KYC on the vendors. You're like, okay, this is gonna give us courage. We know that you can buy 90% of your things through verified vendors. Um, so now we we sort of have that coverage. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, it does, okay. Yeah. <coughs> In Kenya, we use the telecom as our sort of proxy KYC. So if we know their phone number, they already went through a KYC process to get that line. And so you can identify who the person is by that phone number. Um, and then we store all that information though off chain and then the transactions though right now are on a public blockchain so if you do if you were to go in and try to find out the wallet id of that of that user by going through the community and doing transactions you technically could but you you would kind of have to be there in the community so i mean there there is a security level where there is sort of like a you know like coinbase a wallet management system in place, right, that it has that identity, but then we're still using a public ledger right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we don't have a good answer to your second question. That <laughs> <laughs> is the honest truth. Regarding who's running the node. Yeah, because we're, yeah. we're on POA, which is the public sidechain. Oh, you're actually doing it on the XDAI chain? Yeah, because okay. XDAI helps with those timing issues and cost issues. Got it, got it. I thought you were running your own implementation. No, we're running, we're on XDAI. Because they're crazy. 
Yeah, um, I mean, it's the same infrastructure and they're way below capacity, so it makes sense. Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk about like the quantifiable dimensions of blockchain. It's quick, quick, but let me ask some questions. So, what's kind of the flow if there's a disaster? I imagine that you, you got to get everybody onboarded, right? You've got to get the merchants onboarded, the, yeah. the, the users onboarded. So walk through just kind of the, the typical flow. You, I guess is it you work with the nonprofits on the ground, and they're the ones that are kind of onboarding everybody, or yeah. speak to the flow a little bit. So so basically, I mean that's that's you basically got it. Um, not for profits onboard vendors and um, recipients. I mean, simplest hypothesis around like how we want to operate as a company is that these sort of cash transfer programs are actually really great. Like the biggest problem with like, the reason we haven't seen like any cryptocurrency spend processes actually come up in practice in countries, I think, is one because of regulation, um, or the is experiencing right now. And two, it's this cold start network problem, right? Um, you, you can't spend, you can't, even if I had crypto yen right now, I can't walk into, you know, a Lawson's and go, hey, I'd like to buy something with my crypto yen. They're gonna be like, who are you? Go away. Um, and so cache aid programs are actually this really awesome way to kick start these vendor networks inside communities. Because what we've found is that if you tell if you tell vendors we'd like to get you onto this sub esoteric cash program, um, oh sorry, you know, some payments fund they're gonna be like, no, it's a lot of effort. If you tell them there's like a whole bunch of money you have to be injected into the community and the people who accept and make payments will be the ones who get the profit, um, there's something a lot more willing. Because now it's just a financial decision. And so we work with the NGOs to basically set up those networks. Um, the NGOs do a lot of that work of actually selecting recipients. We don't we don't have a strong opinion of where our payments like that. Not a beneficiary selection platform. Uh, and then the vendors is like an economic, just regular sales process. Um, so that happens pretty quickly. Um, Can I link in the Red Cross? Like, so the Red Cross will have like 100,000 volunteers in the country. And I'll give you like an example like in Malawi. Um, when they have, um, there was a, the floods or I guess the, the, sometimes we can't get the money in the country quick enough. We can drive the drugs from South Africa full of cash across the border and then dumping them in a village. And actually, we've seen an airdrop before, and you don't know who's getting the cash and, or strapping it to people's bodies. So, like, we have to put in the context of how we do cash delivery and cash assistance today. Not everybody gets registered, and you don't know who actually is getting cash because you have to drop it in a zone totally devastating. And so even getting this far is, is pretty remarkable. Um, and, and I think you know the nice thing about Nick's, Nick's project is that they've cut down the registration process really quickly, but you're already you're predefining who these people are and you're getting them in the system. That's also with the community currency which is good too because then you start to build this, this network like a mesh, right, where people are already pre-registered. And then I think a really important thing around airdropping is that if there are like droughts or, or issues, since they're already on the network, you can start issuing tokens. I mean, that's the one thing with the community currency is that you can actually provide the leverage. And as the peril gets more and more proof positive, you can increase the number of tokens. But if it is like a false positive, you can extract the tokens and turn them off. Because the problem we have too is we give cash to people once they have cash, it's gone. Whereas if you're token based or, or, or e voucher based, and then back to zero where we work. So, I mean, it's still really archaic in how we distribute cash. It's getting better, but not in, not in a lot of areas. With the phones again, kind of, there's the ability to do like self wallet creation, right? So, you just dial the short code, you've never been on the system before, and you can create a wallet instantly to use within the network. And that's, you know, there's the viral growth of it. We go in and, and do implementation work as well, but once people have those wallets, like there's also information about them, you know, like so it, it, who are they, how, who are you going to airdrop to? There's already that network there and people can self-register that, that speeds things up dramatically. This question at the back. Yeah, um, I was wondering if this uh, is a uh, enabling system where people receiving money, they can start to transact in ways that they weren't able to receive money. So instead of to making money for a community, could it be possible to invest money in a community? I don't know what to like. Oh, I, I mean, you're, you're better to talk about like basically the community currency and the idea of investing in the community. I, I, so this is the whole idea of like putting, you know, this idea of having collateral behind these systems is to basically say, well, can I, can we invest into the growth of that economy? So if you remember this, 
this little bonding curve that we're using, you know, the, the idea is that, like, if here's my price, um, and here's, you know, my reserve, and here it is, you know, here we're at a price of one to one with a reserve. So if I'm a, an investor into that economy, well, the more demand on that there is, the better. So as that economy grows, if they're exporting that, those prices are going to go up, and I can extract that off. I could, if you're an impact investor, you could donate that profit back into the community, and and even you know using this potentially as a tool for remittances. So I, that's at least on our side. That's how we're thinking about this as sort of a, an investment opportunity to bring in private equity. Um, you know, like Red Cross doesn't have enough money again to, to do all these things. So bringing in private equity to invest into the into these reserves. So that's it's, it's similar to like investing into the collateral of, um, of, a, of a microfinance, for instance, right? Like they need seed capital. And so if there's a way to inject seed capital into these currencies, um, there, there's, there's the potential to really grow these economies much more. One of my, um, one of my favorite things that sort of has come out of these digital payment spaces in these emerging economies is the concept of like micropayments um, for like daily needs. Uh, and so there's this really innovative program I think it's in Kenya, um, where this uh, organization has come in and basically been selling efficient hot water heaters to communities or efficient solar panels. I can't remember which one it is. Um, and not a, no individual can afford to make the payment for this outright on the spot because it's quite expensive, but it's something that's going to be a net return for that family in the long run. Um, it's a lot better than the existing system they have in place. And so what they do is to buy it, hook it up to your and pays her account, and it just takes out a tiny payment um, each week or month over the space of like a year or so. Um, and this would be something that would just logistically be impossible to like collect these, you know, have like you know, 400,000 people on it. It'd be, there's no way it make financial sense to like collect you know, a shilling at a time around these communities on a monthly basis. And so by just having it hooked up to this like digital payment system, it actually is now feasible in a way it wouldn't be. Um, and I think it's fascinating because uh, it's something that was just a lot of this digital process. It's called MCOPA. Yeah. yeah. Like MCOPA is to loads, it's a mobile lending system, and they do solar panels and so all sorts of stuff like that. It's really cool. Can hey, I say one thing? So, to the point about this investment side, just, just to add a little bit more color to it, the, human, the worldwide humanitarian budget is about you know $29 billion a year, and it's only up 1% over the last year. Um, but the funding gap is over 30 something billion. But when you look at kind of funding flows, you have like remittance around uh, 550 million, uh, billion dollars a year just remittance, and uh, like foreign direct investment is about the same. About between those two, it's about um, about a trillion dollars so from remittance and foreign direct investment. And then you have private equity funding, which goes, which is like kind of long term, that goes around four to three hundred thousand, three hundred um, billion a year, and. So the point about getting tapping into those markets to be able to play in that kind of nexus of humanitarian and development assistance opens up this kind of floodgate to new financing. And that's what these systems allow for. They allow these rails to get into these communities and build adjacency value, which is if you invest in one community, it helps the other network. It has like this network effect. Yeah. And so as an investor, you can invest in one or two of these communities and see the uplift happen around and then get your cash out eventually. I mean, so that's something. I bring this point because in, in Brazil, uh, we had a social point of Sao Paulo, social point that worked very like this. Uh, community that used it as social point developed so much that it was much more efficient than government's problems that acquired money by taxes and invested on health infrastructure and everything else. So, could have a a huge amount of investment, and we are speaking about government budget being better applied for social impact for all those communities. And you started to mention on, on the bonding curves for that. Uh, do you have any models for that, or even uh, prototypes of this working? Okay, I have got some agent-based models that you can find online. We and they're on GitHub as well, so you can look at that, and then. Um, I mean, there's a lot of modeling around uh, uh, bonding curves right now coming out. Uh, Block Science is doing quite a bit of that work as well, which is very cool. And the bonding curve we're using has kind of, we basically forked a version of the what was originally the Bancorp protocol, and 
and it's got a very simple set of equations on it, but it's been pretty battle tested. I think they've put two billion dollars through the, those systems uh, so far. So, um, yeah. So we're on next time. But yeah, just just connect with me, and I can sure. send you that stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Two questions. Yeah, it's perfect. You heard a lot. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. So, if we wanted to donate, get involved, like what nonprofits is it Red Cross? Is Red Cross doing stuff here? Like what are ways in which like it sounds like you're like a tech startup mm -hmm. and I, I don't know, are you we're a nonprofit? We're a nonprofit, yeah. yeah. But like what are ways in which we can participate in these yeah. things? So I can see one thing is that all of us are working on a project called Community Inclusion Currencies that we are building this global open source platform to allow any organization to do this type of work. And the Danish Red Cross, um, which is where I'm from, and we brought together the Red Cross network along with Accenture and a few other groups to build this platform out. Um, and we're looking at like seven or eight different countries today. So you can either go through Red Cross, you can go, you know, through one of these guys here, and, and, and or put it in die directly give it to die. I mean, you know, there's lots of rails in there. Um, but if that, it, but you know, to really move the market, it has to be something. That size in some ways, but it also doesn't have to be massive. It could be, what, $10,000 it just to see the, see the coin, right, or 5000 So it just depends on the quantum of cash. And What's the, the project called? Community Inclusion Currencies. Is there a website? There's a project, so Nick, Nick is doing, so I'll let you guys yeah. Not yet. We're working on it, yeah. Cool. I, I mean, you can, uh, on the terms of community currencies, if you go to grassroots economics, or look up grassroots economics, you'll find what we've been doing for the last 10 years or so, and, and this is sort of, scaling that up and you know our organization is is really trying to just um, do all the the awareness and you know create MOOCs and um, do the documentation and train you know and, and go and create the trainers of trainers but well, Nick's organization right now is they've just open sourced their whole platform so like all the stuff of bringing in USSD and all these payment uh, rails is, is what he's, he's working a lot on so and that's they're they're looking for VC, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Yep, um, so that's <laughs> and I think that's really exciting because they're basically saying we have here's an open source platform that we're building along with Red Cross um, and other other partners, and they want to be the cheapest rails in and out of that system, right? So they're doing the e-money licensing and all that stuff. So I think it's a great investment on that side. And uh, and for us, what we really want is the ability, like something like Kiva, where you can just or you can say, look, here's two hundred dollars to see the reserve of this women's group, for instance. You know, and, and those types of things like quadratic funding, all these, all these kind of cool funding mechanisms can fit really perfectly into just saying we're going to push some money into these reserves. And that's exactly what Red Cross is doing as well. Like how do we parameterize how we give cash out to, out to communities and then look at those impacts. And there's we have a we have a website uh, called www.sarafu.cc, which is sort of a temporary like dashboard for all the data that you can so, so you can look at. I'll just write it up here. Hopefully it's it's up now, but you can look at just some of those kind of like impact measurements. Sarafu.cc. This is just the last year of we've got about like seventy thousand transactions on there, and you know we've we've anonymized so you don't know who they are, but you can look at the wallet IDs, right? And so you can actually download that entire database of every single transaction. You know the gender of the both parties, you know the products of both parties, you know what they're buying. It's a huge data set. I mean, and we've just, uh, this is this is among about six, you know, it's like, I think we're at 5,600 users right now. And they're do, they've done about 120K USD of transactions just in the last few months. And so like, the systems are, are starting to churn out a huge amount of information. So it's, and, and that information all, all relates to things like food security, education, you know, what types of food are they buying, nutrition, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, picking out like sustainable development goals and being able to say these tra transactions relate to these wash outcomes, for instance, for water and sanitation. Um, yeah. I, I think there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done, you know, in terms of like also like customizing and localizing the system. Like once this platform it is really rolling and, you know, ideally even by and November will have, uh, I mean, things are working, but it's like sticks and bubblegum kind of, you know, stage at, at this point. And uh, once that's up there, there's a, there's a huge need for customization, for data analysis, for prediction, for, you know, um, uh, marketplaces, you know, like, so bringing this to Bogota, 
in Colombia, you, you would probably want a, a GPS app that's going to tell you where to go buy or how to use your currencies and, and, and marketplaces, all, all kinds of stuff like that. So there's a, there's a lot of layers that need to be built up and localized completely. And so hopefully that's, you know, App Store-esque, you know, <coughs> concept where you have plugins and stuff like that. So. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, we're open source, but we're, I mean, where our hypothesis is that this is going to, like, totally change. I mean, at this point, I think it's really fascinating number of users. So $440 billion is sent globally to, like, emerging companies each year from overseas. Uh, and the overheads on that process right now are just absolutely huge. Um, because you have to go through the banking services, and the banking services just charge you know, up to 20%, um, which is just money that's basically managing into the ether. Um, organizations like um, TransferWise have got around this basically by doing peer to peer matching. Um, the idea of I'm trying to send money between the US and Australia, and someone trying to send money from Australia to the US, um, well, rather than going through the banking service, you can have my money and I can have yours and we're done. Um, which is really clever um, because it skips that middle process, but it only works in places. It only allows you to skip banking processes in places where there's a symmetric flow of money in both directions, right? The second you've got all the money flowing in one one way, then there's no one to match with, and so the process breaks down. Uh, the really cool thing about these bonding curves and what we're doing with like cryptocurrency, once you have the vendor network on the ground, you don't need a matching, so you can do asymmetric flows of money into places like Kenya. Um, and we do some things that I've glossed over today about. We basically re-peg re -peg to the local currency using the synthetic assets. We take the same concept of what DAI does, and then we do that to DAI again one more time. Um, so that then gets pegged to local currencies and people aren't exposed to like exchange rate fluctuations. Um, and that re-pegging process is a lot more efficient than what goes on in regular markets because it's basically you can aggregate things through new swap um, style exchanges. Um, so we think there's like some really interesting things that can be done there at a global scale just to totally change the way we do financing and get money into communities. Uh, I actually I was going to ask about that because um, people are exposed to US dollar uh, price risk as well, yeah. right? Um, and what is it like, because most developing countries they would rather use the US dollar, uh, except obviously their governments would probably fall apart if they did. Yeah. Um, so isn't there kind of like a balancing act so that if you're very successful and then you allow people to essentially completely escape the shackles of their own like local currency, would they just yeah, so price? two answers to that. Uh, one is that we tend to, like we, we've noticed people often, we, don't, we haven't worked in the community yet where there's been like monetary failure. Uh, or existing financial system right now. We like to work in communities where actually that aspect of the financial system works well. Um, and the reason we do that is because then we can use this synthetic asset process to peg to local currency. And that means that a government retains control over their monetary policy. So if they want to, if they want to artificially lower the price of their currency by an order of magnitude just by you know printing infinite money, um, they're able to, and there's nothing we can, our system won't disrupt that. Um, that's just a philosophical, not philosophical, it's just a design, pragmatic choice of set code. Like, that is the way you don't piss off governments, it's the way you end up going in jail. Um, so, yeah, we, we have, we're yet to operate in a place like Venezuela. Venezuela. Right. Right. In Kenya, there's, this, there's a blockchain task force there in the government. They're, they're very excited about this idea of potentially you know, creating a Kenyan shilling, a digital Kenyan shilling, right, their own, and and treating these exactly as they would the private banking world, right? So they, they create reserve currency, banks can leverage that just like they do now, right? They have 10% reserve requirement, right? Well, we're just saying, put that on chain and make it honest. Like, because you don't really know, does the bank have 10% reserve or not? And, and the bonding curve gives you transparency to that situation. And so we can basically say, well, let villages or groups also act like private <coughs> banks. If the government wants them to have a reserve requirement, wonderful. That's a great situation now. So they've just allowed communities now to act as their own banks, and that would be a huge win. So I, I can see, you know, like there, there can be a lot of play in the regulatory environment. If they want to start regulating this in that way by having some uh, insurance or you know collateral requirements in their own token, wonderful. That could be a really wonderful way to bring governments on board. And I, I mean. I don't think Chase Bank should issue dollars, you know, or, or in Kenya, like Wells Fargo should not be issuing shillings, they should be issuing Wells Fargo shillings, right? Which should be on a bonding curve and they should be honest about how much reserve they have. If they start, because we've had four banks 
overissue supply of credit and go bankrupt in the last four years, and it's caused huge harm across the world. I mean, this is not just Kenya, right? This is yeah. the whole world doing this. So if we can create honest banking this way, you know, and, and redo how we think about fractional reserve and put it on the blockchain, I, I think that would be a huge win. So I, I, I tend to lump this thing into yeah. that sort of like, if there was a movement towards like transparent fractional reserve or something like that, that, that would be super powerful. Cool. I just don't stand on that. I think like the concept of like Bitcoin or some sort of global reserve model like that creating financial inclusion um, and actually being used as like a payment process in emerging economies is just a, like a totally naive myth. Um, as including the suggestion that it will help save women's problems and things like the one ripple. Um, like communities fundamentally need to work on the currencies they're used to. Um, and so if you're if you're talking about trying to use something like Bitcoin to shift your money efficiently between one community and the other, if you need to take your Bitcoin or your ripple and go through some sort of exchange process with a bank to then convert that into your local currency. You've basically missed out. You're going through the existing banking process again, and all you've done is add an extra layer back into the problem you had in the first place. So, really, these sort of synthetization processes and these ideas of creating on chain reserves is the only way that this is actually going to credit like borders. Oh, yeah. Is Cache becoming more and more the way, like, like, is that becoming more and more common among Ooh, the ways? That's it. So, it's growing 40% that... year on year. Okay. So, so for Red Cross, is that something that is happening more and more, just like straight cash aid? The the global cash market right now is about um, uh, four point seven, four point eight billion dollars. The Red Cross accounts for a billion dollars a year. It's, and is it on? Like, is it growing quickly? Yeah, the Red Cross. Is, I mean, we just start actually looking at cash in itself as a component and understanding what that quantum is a few years ago. Um, it wasn't part of it. The the United Nations is about two point six billion. So, um, and accounts for probably like 15, about 15% 50 of our overall aid, and it's growing. I mean, 40% is a, is a, I don't think it's quite 40% because right. that's a huge, I mean, that would go from like five. No, no, so you're, you, this that's, that's exactly you're, you're a year out of date, it's not $10 million a year in terms of cash. It's what? growing that quickly. It's $10 billion. It's $10 billion, billion now it's done with cash. Uh, and the latest number from 2018. Yes, it was was four point six. I don't know if I totally agree with, with, with that because how it was cash. No, no, no. Because when you get cash, there's different ways. It's like cash through other organizations. Yeah, it's how do they actually calculate what that cash is? So I'm saying like actual handing out physical cash. It's about four points. But whatever, it's still a shitload of money. Yeah. <laughs> can, I just, can I just jump yeah. in? So it's yeah. I work a lot with these guys, but I like my specialty is cash transfer and delivery and humanitarian. So I think what's important to know that's like not immediate knowledge in this space is that the World <coughs> Humanitarian Summit had a bunch of commitments, grand bargain calling, from the world's biggest donors, but also from the member countries of the United Nations and local governments, saying that the, one of the number one priorities today is to, to, is to deliver the maximum amount of humanitarian aid possible in the form of payments. So whether it's cash in hand, whether it's like debit cards, whether it's using a blockchain, rail, whether it's paper vouchers, that's that's considered the gold standard in humanitarian practice today. And that's what's really driving a lot of this growth. But the problem is that those actors that are delivering don't necessarily know and are not necessarily aware that there is now a technology that's like programmable money that can allow them to make their systems more efficient. So in that sense, I think it's a massive untapped market of like endless use cases for the blockchain sector to engage with. I think we're out of time. So I'm gonna put my my Twitter or telegram is E N J E Y W N J W. So my initials but Vanessa size poly. so if you want to get in contact with anything, have a deal with my chat W R and Wills is W O